Okay, so for our first project, and this is my first project in beginning drawing, figure drawing, beginning painting, even in my intermediate drawing levels, I always do this project first because there's so much that drawing from an egg can teach us. And then also, as an instructor, I can get a really good sense of where a student is technically based on the way that they draw something like an egg. So the reason that we begin with the egg is because it is a simple form and it has a, a lot of characteristics that much more complex forms also have. The way that you're going to set up the drawing is you're going to start by using two pieces of white paper. Now students will sometimes put down like white cloth and that's fine if you want to produce a, a drawing or a painting that is also dealing with all the extra elements that each one of those folds is going to offer you. I suggest for this project, and it's a requirement, that you use white paper. Now, the reason that I like white paper is because if you look at the egg, you will see that there is a reflected light. So we have a reflected light here. And um, if this paper is colored, like if I put this piece of orange cloth here, you'll see that the reflected light now has changed color. And then also that there is a shift in the um, color in the shadows too. Even down in here, we also now have a shift in the color. So, Anything that you put up here that has color is going to affect the way that the reflective light and also the colors that are in the egg and surrounding the egg are going to be visible. Our focus is on value. So whether you're doing this for a painting class or a drawing class for me, our focus is on value. And we're going to examine the different elements of the um, value scale that we can see visible. So we have reflected light here and here. We have a cast shadow. And then within the cast shadow, you can see that there's core shadow here. And then there's also a lighter shadow here, which is the reflected light from the egg bouncing back down into the um, shadow area. On the egg, we have reflected light. We have shadow. And then we have core shadow in there. And then we have an area that is light. And we have highlights here. And then also down here in this reflected light, that's probably the lightest light source that I can see. And so that down there is also highlight. When you set up your egg, I want you to think about this line here that acts as a horizon line that's created by the join in the two pieces of paper. What's nice is when you paint fabric that you don't have a very distinct line there, but I think that this actually offers us a great opportunity to play with composition. What is the uh, association between the top of the egg and that line? If you move that egg, how does the relationship between that line and the egg um, change and what does it do for the composition? To me, there's no negative space there. That line is kind of awkward coming into the top of the egg. So to me, that, that wouldn't be a good choice for a composition. So I'd move the egg. So I, now I have that negative space or just that visible space between the top of the egg and the horizon line. So students always ask me why I begin with the egg. You know, some students have actually felt that it's, it's below their drawing ability to draw an egg. That's completely false. I think that I have acquired a good variety of technical skills in my practice and, and sometimes I draw the egg or I paint the egg just to remind myself of the complexities of a value system that you can see in, in such a um, simple color scheme and form scheme. If we take a sphere you can see that many of the same types of um, value situations are appearing on the sphere as they are on the egg. This is something nice to always think about, allowing your cast shadow to project over the two um, planes that we have, the back plane and the, the ground plane. 
But here you can see we have the core shadow, shadow, reflected light, cast shadow, again core shadow, reflected light again, shadow, highlight. So we have the same type of value system happening. So if we remove the, the sphere and replace it with a skull, you can see the similarities that are visible, particularly in the form of the egg and then the form of the cranium. We also have an egg-like shape that can come through here. We also have an egg-like shape that's in here. So the egg itself is repeated in a number of places on the skull. If I turn the egg towards us, you'll see that we have a convex shape. So here we have a convex shape. That same convex type of shape can be seen here on the zygomatic bone. That same shape, if we turn the egg and face it this way, so the more round part is this direction, that same shape here is visible here in the maxilla to the mandible. So the egg and the skull have a lot in common. Furthermore, the way that light is receiving uh, or receding over the skull is the same as light is receding over the egg. So you have a lot of similarities. And so if you can think about the simple form of the egg while you're drawing the skull, then you'll be able to um, create a more dimensional and believable drawing. So one last note here, you can see the difference in the uh, intensity of the reflected light from the white egg and the cream skull. The white is reflecting the light a lot more um, intensely. Just look at the difference here in just this real uh, simple color relationships. There is a difference in intensity. There's also a difference too. There will be a difference in color. So in here you see that the uh, reflected light that is visible in the cast shadow has a yellow tint to it. Whereas over here we have very little difference in color inside the shadow. So it's always best to use the pure white object for this first drawing or first painting. Students sometimes say to me that they have a problem because their living situation doesn't allow them to have a single light source on because of roommates working in the dorm rooms or what have you. It's really imperative that you find somewhere to work because how many lights you have on is really going to affect the way that the drawing comes out in the end. So if you just watch, When I turn the overhead lights on, we still have a strong sense of light coming from my light source, but that's diffused now because of the extra light from above that's also created extra shadows and it's diminished the reflected light. It's actually created a lot less of a visible difference between your value ranges, so your job is a lot harder. In my opinion, it's really worth it to Stop by the hardware store, buy a clamp light and a flood bulb, and to set yourself up properly because your job is going to be much easier in terms of the work that you have to do. But more importantly, you're going to learn to see better, which makes your drawing better, which is going to increase your technical proficiency, which is going to make your whole experience of learning to draw that much more successful. So just as equally important as setting up your still life is setting up your drawing area. I have a French easel, which is a collapsible easel, which you can get one of these easels for under $100. And just to let you know, you know, kind of the investment. I've had my easel for well over a decade. I use it all the time. It still functions. It was a wonderful purchase. Um, and it's something that if you treat properly, it will last. But you don't have to have an easel. But definitely what I don't want you doing is trying to do your drawings on your fridge door or on a wall with texture or on a carpeted floor. You'll notice I'm standing up. I, as I've told you, I always prefer to stand up to draw. I think when you're sitting down, especially when you're sitting down on drawing horses, um, you're placing your body in a relationship to your drawing board that's 
difficult to maneuver and it also affects the way that you're going to measure and sight. Um, so drawing itself I think is uh, made more difficult by being seated so I always prefer that you stand up. We've spoken that the um, best height for your drawing board is between your belly button and your shoulders. When you start to draw very low or draw very high, then you're going to affect your relationship to your drawing and that can alter the accuracy of what you're, of not so much what you're seeing but what you're drawing because you're drawing up here so it's going to appear different where you're drawing down here and it's going to appear different. Now I make 10 foot drawings sometimes and I know how to work around those types of problems but it takes some practice. When you're and when I'm working in an observational drawing situation I, uh, I don't work 10 foot when I'm working directly from something. So I have my drawing board at a height that I think is the best height for what I'm going to be doing. I've placed myself in a relationship to what I'm drawing so that because I'm right handed the left side of me is open so I don't have anything between um, what I'm drawing and what I'm seeing on my paper. If I'm drawing this way and I'm drawing right handed <clears throat> then I'm going to be looking over my shoulder and sometimes that can get in the way. So if I'm drawing like this, then that's not going to happen. If you're doing something like a sight size method, where you're um, setting yourself up so you're drawing everything exactly the same ratio as what you see on your paper, then you definitely can't have something between yourself and your object. So um, you see I, I've um, taped my board, my piece of paper down so, that's, so it doesn't move during the drawing process. That's very important. There's nothing more annoying than your drawing moving around as you're trying to draw and especially since we're going to be using mass and we're going to be um, moving a lot of charcoal around on the surface. So my first step is to tone my paper. I have my chamois. Uh, your chamois probably is new so it's probably cleaner but my chamois is nice and full of charcoal already so I can actually use this to apply a um, tone to the paper because it's nice and full of charcoal. I can also take a piece of my charcoal, in this case I'm using hard vine charcoal, I'm going to apply it to the paper surface. Then I'm going to take my chamois and I'm going to smooth out my value. You want to tone your paper to about a middle gray value. If it's too dark, it's very difficult to draw into. If it's too light, then you can't use it as a midtone for your drawing. Could be a little darker. So now my paper's toned and we're ready to begin. So before I start to begin, I'm going to evaluate everything I'm doing. Um, I have my measuring stick. So sometimes um, you see that even my measuring stick isn't quite perfectly straight, but it's pretty good. But sometimes students will just want to use their charcoal. Look at the difference between that and that. So it'd be, it's kind of difficult to sight angles and straight lines with a uh, piece of charcoal that is curvilinear. So I'm going to start by first just measuring that horizon line where the paper meets the the background plane meets the foreground plane. So you see how like the charcoal wasn't really taking there when I was doing that? 
Charcoal is a natural material, so you're going to find places in the charcoal sometimes where um, it doesn't seem like it's taken to the paper. In that case, move the charcoal around and find another spot because you probably can find one, especially with the hard charcoal, you, you may run into that. So I'm going to draw a line to um, indicate the background plane and the bottom plane. And each time I draw it, I'm going to measure against what I see to see if it's accurate. So there's the horizon line that I see in front of me. Now I have two light sources on, I can't remember if I said this or not, but I have two light sources on. Again, I only want you to have one light source, it's just that I need the light source in order to uh, video what I'm doing. So I'm going to start just with the mass drawing of my egg. If I put it in the center of the paper, that's one type of composition. But I think um, it's when I look at the egg, it's not exactly in the center of this line. If I evaluate where it is, it's going to interact with the line about here and here. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to put in my mast shape. Now one of the things I want you to think about is the fact that I just drew that whole shape and you didn't see me pick the tool up off the page. To me that's important. I'm kind of feeling my way around that shape. I'm looking at the, the shape and I'm feeling my way around it. So I'm not picking my tool up, I'm thinking about the wholeness of the shape, and also I'm starting to see the specific contours of the edges. So I'm going to build up the shape of the egg without ever really picking my tool up off the page. So there's the basic shape that I'm going to work with. I'm going to evaluate the distance from this part of the egg, which would be like the top to the line. That looks pretty good. I think that my egg needs to come further down, so I'm going to make that adjustment now. So I think one of the most difficult things for me when I first started drawing was this idea that every mark that I made had to be really visible. And I was very, very heavy handed in how I drew. But the more I've got comfortable with drawing, the more that I've learned to see, the more I know that I can make a lot of mistakes while I'm drawing. And those mistakes aren't really mistakes. They're just um, visual indicators of where I was looking and what I was thinking as I was looking and finding my way around my composition. So I'm take my chamois and I can use this to simply erase my drawing where I need to. And then I can also use this as a way to put in my light sources. So my light is coming from the left. So I'm going to apply my light source. And now, for me, as I draw the way that I want you to draw the way that I draw, is that now when I'm looking at the object and then recreating on the page, it's this constant sort of push-pull between applying material and pulling material out and going back and forth sort of like a dance. So I have my basic shape now. I'm going to put in my shadow. And then, because I have two light sources on, like I said, 
I have another shadow back here. So as I build up the drawing, this lighter shadow that I have here will create this contour because we're drawing without line. So it's the relationships of one value against another that will create a specific contour of a form or an object. So when I first started drawing, you know, I wanted to get to my darks really quickly. I really wanted that those darks because I wanted the dynamic contrast in the drawing. And it took me a while to sort of really see as, a, as someone that was learning to draw um, that it's often the intermediary values that really create the form and make the form come alive. I remember reading when I was young that Rodin really liked to draw with charcoal because he loved to make the charcoal crack under the weight and pressure of his hand. And I, I still really enjoy that too. Um, but that type of drawing tends to be a type of drawing that is difficult to crack. And so everything that I teach now and the way that I try to draw is all about making drawings that are easy uh, to crack and, and get accurate. So I'm looking at my drawing and I'm considering it. I'm going to cite the angle of my uh, shadow. So my shadow is at a pretty accurate angle. And I, what I'm going to do now is just continue to build the drawing up. I'm looking at my drawing and again I'm considering the relationship between the line in the top, and I can see that this is too high, so I can just use my chamois or chamois and just make the changes that I need. So if I'm changing the height, then I'm also going to have to change the width. And I'm not going to hesitate to make any change that I need to make to make the drawing accurate. To me, that's super important about teaching how to draw is for you to see, you know, that when you know the person who's instructing you makes a drawing that they make mistakes and that the object isn't to never make a mistake but the object is to never let the mistake stand if you see something is wrong then fix it if you are three hours into a drawing and you see an inaccuracy in what you're drawing then it's you, you know your duty you have like a responsibility to fix that inaccuracy and to make it accurate. So my egg is going is basically life size to the egg that I'm seeing. You can make a, a choice. You can make your drawings of your eggs quite large or quite small. It's up to you. In the PowerPoint that I have for you that you um, can view where you see the examples from students, then you can um, see that there's a, a variety of ways to deal with the issue of making this drawing. It doesn't have to be a drawing that doesn't have some oomph to it visually. It can have oomph to it. You know, it can be an exciting drawing. It's all about what you bring to the drawing. So. The issue isn't so much that you're drawing a simple form within a simple value scheme. Instead, it's this idea that you are um, looking at light and form, dimensionality, um, relationships in space, 
all those art fundamentals that are really exciting and can make any work of art an exciting work of art. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go through now and I'm just going to work up my drawing. And every now and then I'll point something out, but for the most part I'm just going to focus now on, on getting my drawing accurate. So I'm actually going to measure the width of my shadow against my egg. So I'm going to use my thumb and the tip of my stick as a measuring um, guide. So I'm going to measure my shadow and I'm going to measure it into the egg once. One and three quarters. Once. One and three quarters. Okay. So my shadow is about the right length. And sometimes, you know, I think when students first start doing something like this, they get really frustrated by the idea of making a guess like that. Like, what is a three-quarter distance on your measuring stick? Well, you know, learning to see means learning to um, develop skills that you don't already have. So learning to eye it, make a, a decision based on what you think is accurate in terms of and an analysis of space, that's part of learning to draw. And it's a very important part of learning to draw. And it can be frustrating. It totally can be frustrating. And that's okay. So you can see why I like to use the vine charcoal, and I have you all use the vine charcoal. It's extremely malleable. You can really work the material. I haven't changed densities of, of charcoal yet. I'm still using the hard charcoal, and 
um, anytime that I have something that I need to change, I can simply, um, even just using my finger, if I push down hard enough, I can remove the information that I've created on the paper just by um, pushing down, the, the charcoal will come off. So it's really malleable and it takes away, for, in my thinking, it takes away the types of fears that people bring to drawing with them, like, oh, what if I make a mistake? What if my drawing isn't good? What if my drawing isn't accurate? Especially um, in my figure drawing courses, the idea of like, you know, drawing a face, that's really, um, can be really, intimidating and you know why because it's this really hard thing to draw and it's a great challenge to draw so anything that you can do to make your drawing experience easier you know that's that's really what matters so I think if you know you can use a material that's really malleable and is something that you can build up step by step like you see that I'm nowhere have I gone and drawn like this when I started my drawing, I didn't I didn't draw my egg. Now that's a contour drawing, and we're using mats. And there's a time for drawing like this, and a time for drawing like this. And when I teach observational drawing, we learn mass because it's a lot more malleable, and it also allows you to experience dimensionality differently. This is very flat. It's very design orientated it's very linear. This is much more dimensional and has a different type of focus. So here I have my reflected light and um, I'm going to create my reflected light by putting a darker value up against that light. And there's, no, there's no need for a line here. If I put a line there, then that flattens out that space, but it also doesn't talk about the transition from light to dark that is appearing in that space. So I can accurately um, give a visual indication about that transition by using values that are just um, touching one another. All the surrounding area around the egg has equal visual importance as the egg itself. The value that's back here greatly affects this egg. So if the drawing progresses in terms of, you know, I have a drawing that's just egg, there's no background at all, then when I go and put in my shadows or my midtones that are surrounding my egg, then all of a sudden the whole drawing is going to be affected. So one of my drawing teachers always spoke about um, working up your whole drawing all at once, and that's very important because all these values are going to affect one another. So it's equally important to, to build up the space that's surrounding the egg as much as it is to build up the egg itself. That's why it's nice to work into a toned surface because we are not um, dealing with this dynamic contrast that happens when you start applying material into a white piece of paper or onto a white canvas. Now you're going to see different values on the papers because the paper um, probably isn't going to lay perfectly flat. I actually, if I look right now, I actually have a really strong shadow coming across that's being created from the light source I have up for the recording and my drawing board. And I just moved the camera angle and when I did that, 
I had to make a change to the lights, the secondary light source. My primary light source is the same, but there's been a shift to my secondary light source. And so this shadow back here has actually diminished in intensity because of this darker value that's been placed across here. So I wouldn't usually do that because obviously it changes the drawing, but in this situation I wanted to make sure that you had the best angle for the demonstration. So as an artist I can make decisions. I can say, well I need to deal with that, or maybe I don't want to deal with that. For my demonstration I'm going to deal with it because I want you to see the importance of drawing directly from observation and to attempt to be um, really rendering what you see very accurately. So the paper will start, it has a tooth, so the paper will start to fill up with charcoal and sometimes becomes less receptive. So I feel like I've, I've got, the bulk of my drawing is accurate. I'm probably not going to make too many changes, though you always find yourself making changes during the drawing. I feel comfortable now in changing the density of my charcoal so that I can use a softer charcoal that will still take to the paper. So that's what I'm going to do, I'm going to change my charcoal. So now I'm going to go to the medium vine charcoal and it's a lot softer. Softer means that you can make darker lines or darker values. This edge up here is really quite dark. One of the things I want to stress too is that it's important as you're drawing to not move around because every time that you move that you're going to alter your relationship to what you're drawing. So try to keep um, the same distance from your drawing and keep your feet in the same spot. And sometimes I'll have students mark the floor with tape where they're drawing from so that they don't lose their spot. It's not a bad idea, that. The great benefit to using the vine charcoal is that you can remove it to make changes just by using your finger or your chamois. The great problem with using vine charcoal is that you can remove it with your finger or your chamois. So to me that's a problem worth dealing with because if I make a a decision in terms of a value and then I go to smooth it out or something with my finger and it removes, that's no problem because I can just reapply that value and, and you know maybe it actually wasn't right and it saved me a little bit of um, grief. So when I start looking for real subtle intermediate values, I squint my eyes and that really condenses the values and lets me see them a bit more dynamically. It's a great way to see color and value.
So one of the things that happens, and I try to stop it from happening as often as I can, but someone always wants to incorporate white charcoal, and they say, you know, the paper is toned and I can't get it back to white. And white charcoal is problematic because it, it creates a cool value when you mix it with the charcoal and there all of a sudden is color in your value drawing. And so it suddenly your eye is really drawn to that white charcoal. At this point, you've noticed I haven't done any erasing at all. I've done, I mean, that's not act completely true. I've done erasing, but only with my finger. So this is the first time you see that I'm incorporating an eraser and I'm going to use it to really pull out my reflected light down here. And it, this is one of those click erasers. I really love these things. It's just a, basically the same as the white rubber eraser that you have uh, purchased for the class. But I like them because they're, they're, I like the size of them and they're actually dead cheap so they are um, I think a great tool. Sometimes students ask me if I don't like line drawing and I just it's kind of funny because in my own studio when I'm working on the bulk of what has become my um, body of work dealing with hair, the whole way that I draw is only with line. But even though I'm drawing with line, I'm thinking about mass. So it's really... For me, when I really started to use mass and see mass it was like an aha moment and everything clicked and so um, you know, we, we teach what we, we know and we teach what we like and we teach what uh, we have found really works for us and you know for me I think learning to draw with mass makes all the difference So it may be because I changed the light source, but there's a little bit of a difference back here in this space. I'm going to change that. And reassess it. So there's that push-pull. I'm going to bring that value right up to the edge of my egg and let that value create that edge. So the 
exposing on the camera makes the drawing look a little darker than it actually is. I still haven't really gone and, and made too many really dark, dark areas yet. That's a great trick. Again, the lighter something is, you know, the more you can change it and the more you can seek and search for that accuracy. When I'm using my sighting stick, I'm not bending my elbow. And when I first started set myself up to draw, I made sure that I was going to have the right amount of distance that I needed so that I could sight and then maneuver so that I didn't have to change the way that I was holding my stick. That way I'm not going to alter my, my measurement. All these things matter. like when we're drawing in class and um, sometimes I have to remind someone that they can't start a drawing standing up and finish it sitting down. Change your whole point of view and that affects the success of your drawing. It's a little darker in there. So I can just use my chamois and just lift off little bits of value. So I think for this last step I'm going to go to the soft charcoal. So I've kind of mentioned this. I see drawing like this kind of like painting. So now I'm going to use my softest charcoal, which is going to give me you know, my densest black. And I don't want to make everything um, a really dark value. I've worked really hard to maintain my lights and my midtones, but I want that dark to really make the drawing have the contrast that I see. So in places where I see that the darkest areas, I'm going to apply my my soft fine charcoal. You know, you may find yourself making a mistake like I just did or letting the thickness of the charcoal kind of take over the the edge you needed to create. actually another shadow that's sort of moving around this cast shadow.
little bit of shadow in here. This can go darker. So you can see that lovely soft charcoal really lets you apply that value. That's why you don't really want to start your drawing with the soft charcoal. You can sharpen your charcoal so it has a nice tip to it, if you want. I'm going to go back to this again. This doesn't seem, seem accurate to me. better. <laughs> so a little, little crease in the paper here. So then you would just continue to work the drawing until you felt that it really accurately showed all the values that were visible in your still life. The next step after this, if you'd like, would be to use a nice sharp charcoal pencil just to accentuate your darks. Don't go in and add a lot of line though, just accentuate your darks, then fix the drawing.